ISO 27001 Annex A 518 Access Right. So what is it that the standard is looking for so we know what it is that we're going to try and implement? Access rights to information and other associated assets should be provisioned, reviewed, modified and removed in accordance with the organization's topic specific policy and rules for access control. So what we can see here is a reference to a topic specific policy. We've already done that and covered that in the other controls. But we're going to need a topic specific policy all around access management really. It's the full end to end life cycle for access management. Here specifically we're looking at the access control element of that and we're going to put in place a couple of rules, some rules around what it is that we expect and how we implement our access. So let's have a little look at that implementation guide for you. Okay, some key principles when it comes to access. You want to get the authorization of the asset owner, right? It makes sense. The owner of the asset is going to approve uh, access to that asset. An asset owner has many responsibilities when it comes to assets, but one of them is approving access. Access will be based on policy and business requirements. So what we want to see as part of that access management process is the business reasoning, why we need that. But when we provision our access, we make sure we do that based on business need and we do that based on the policy that we put in place. We're going to separate out the person that makes the request from the person that approves it and the person that provisions it. This references back to segregation of duty. So you can understand when we went through segregation of duty, we were looking at conflict of interest, removing conflict of interest. The reason that we wanted to do that was to reduce the likelihood of fraud or one person compromising a process for their own personal gain. Um, so we see that time and time again. So what we're saying here is that the person that requests it is going to be separate from the person that approves it. Access rights are provided for as long as needed. So here we're looking at how long does somebody need those access rights? In the olden days, we'd provide somebody with access and it would just run and run and run. What we want to be doing at looking in our implementation is defining and understanding how long a person may need that access. Okay, the easiest catch all is for the life time that they're an employee or a contractor working for us. But if we can get more granular over that, get more control over that, then we can make ourselves more secure. This becomes more important when we're looking at third party access into our systems. So third party access into our systems, again, is going to go through that approval process, is going to go through that provisioning process. But definitely for third parties, we want to define the length of time that they have access. There is a separate blog on that, but there are challenges that come with third party accounts, third party access into our systems from being the use of generic accounts. We often see that support accounts that many people have access to and third party accounts are ones that easily get forgotten and easily get lost within our system. So we want to fully manage that. But whatever the account is, we want some kind of indication about the life of that account based on the business need. How long do they need it to execute the role that they've got? When somebody leaves the organization, we want to remove the access, right? Our process has to remove access from people that, move, that leave our organization. This can also be the case if people move role. So let's have a little sidebar into the moving of roles. When people move role, when people move department, when people get a new job within the organization, ideally what we should be doing is requesting their access rights again and then using role-based access, which I'll come to in a moment, reprovisioning their access to systems. What we don't want to be doing is adding on additional access to additional systems based on their current role. Okay, that's going to create a hybrid, that's going to create problems for us, it's going to negate why we went with role-based access in the first place. So when somebody moves role, we want to make sure that we remove their existing access and reprovision the access. When somebody leaves our organization, we want to remove their access to systems. And when a third party leaves our organization or the account is no longer required, we want to remove the access for that as well. Access to systems and the approval process follows the step approval, then grant access. OK, what we're not going to do is grant everybody access and then retrofit and create the admin that shows that that was approved. Are we? Are we? Okay. 
So in the real world, ideally what you don't want to be doing is creating all of those accounts and then going back and retrofitting your process to show the administration of how it was approved. All right, make sure you get those the right way around. Yes, going forward, definitely. Records of who has access to what is maintained. So again, referencing into role-based access, but whatever approach that you've taken, you're going to maintain records of who has access to what. That is going to be the tool, the record, uh, the artifact that you're going to use to manage access, right? You need to have a record of who has access to what. You're going to use it when you're doing your access reviews. You're going to do it when people and uh, third parties leave the organization. You're going to be using that to see what people have got, making sure that they still need it and then removing it when they don't need it. So make sure that you've got those records of access, who has access to what. And we're going to conduct those regular reviews. Access to systems is going to be reviewed on a regular basis. Now, there are a couple of different reviews that you can consider. There is the review of the, ac uh, of the asset uh, owner, right? So whoever owns the asset that you have provided access to has to do a review on a periodic basis. Now, ideally, that would mean monthly that they're going through the systems and data that they have and making sure that the people that are allocated access to it still need the access and the access is appropriate to them and what they're doing. But there are other access reviews that you can do. There are technical access reviews, system access reviews, information security access reviews. There are HR reviews. You know, the accountability of where it lands is going to be down to you based on your risk and your business need. But the bare minimum you need to do is do a review of access. The bare, bare minimum you need to do is do that on an annual basis. I would be advocating for at least monthly. Your worst case scenario for me would be quarterly. OK, half yearly. Um, but to meet the requirements of the standard, you could get away with just doing it annually. But you need to review that access. So what are some general considerations that we can look at here? What are general considerations that we can look at here? Well, we can look at role based access, right? Within the ISO 27001 toolkit, the ultimate toolkit for ISO 27001 certification, because this comes up time and time again, I've actually provided you with the process and the tools and the templates to implement the management of role based access control. Role-based access control, we've touched on, there are other videos on it, but at a super high level, first of all, you define the roles that the organization needs. You remove any conflicts of interest that there may be within those roles. So that's an academic ex exercise. What are the roles that we've got? What access do they have? Remove the conflict. Then after that, you allocate those roles to individuals. So that's super high level. Please check out the other videos on role-based access control, but it's a good piece of guidance when it comes to this particular annex. One of the other things that I would say is cloning accounts, right? Cloning accounts, cloning access is a no-go. I have seen so many times how much hot water that this can get you into. This is an absolute nightmare, right? Cloning accounts that may not be pure, that may not be true, you know, oh, we've got this manager, he's taking over this particular manager's role, can you just clone their access? The answer is no. We want to go back based on business need, the rules that we've defined. We want to go back based on role based access and we want to allocate them the access that they need. We don't want to clone accounts. I shouldn't have to say why it's a bad idea. It's a bad idea. Don't do it. Don't include it in your process. Don't have it as part of what you're going to be doing. How to comply. So how you're going to comply with this is you're going to implement that process for requesting, approving, implementing and removing the access. Right. So this is all about access rights. What is an auditor going to check? An auditor is going to check a couple of things. They're going to check that you haven't done something stupid, right? So they go through the rules, they go through the procedures, they go through the access, and then they get you to prove that they that you have implemented that. Things that we see here are people that have left the organization that still have access. We see people with access that doesn't have the appropriate process and documentation and evidences of approval. We see uh, things in here where reviews haven't happened on a regular basis. So make sure you've done Make sure you've done what it is that you said you were going to do. One of the things that they like to do here is they like to look at admin accounts. Again, this is some low hanging fruit, you know, going into admin accounts and then getting you to explain who those admins are. Oftentimes we see in here that people have left the organization, that there are service accounts, generic accounts, which you can have refer back to the previous blog and the previous guides, uh, but should be avoided. Or they're going to see service accounts, third party accounts in here that actually you thought had been removed and haven't. So before the audit, make sure that you check. The top three mistakes that you make. 
somebody's left the business, third parties have open access, and your documentation is either not in place, is incomplete, or all your version control is wrong. So that's ISO 27001 access. This is all about access, right? You've been doing this for years. There isn't anything particularly difficult in here. There isn't anything particularly new in here. This is about tightening up the procedures that you've got, tightening up the implementation that you've done, auditing it, checking it, removing anything that's um, an anomaly that, that's within there, and then just making sure that you follow it, okay? So my name is Stuart Barker. I remain the ISO 27001 Ninja. We continue our journey through these tutorials. So until the next tutorial video, peace out.